Okay, good evening, everybody. Hi, Chris. Can you turn this back on? Oh, sorry. Hold on. We're going we're gonna to get this started in just a moment. Okay, that's going to take a moment, and we'll get that going. All right. So good, good evening, everybody, again. My name is Christina Medvin. I'm the Director of Community Outreach here at Marine Corps Conservancy. We have a few more staff members here tonight, so I'm just going to quickly introduce Megan Dean in the back. She's our Director of Education. So if you're interested in any of our school programs or any education programs, you can talk to her after the rest of this presentation. Um, Heather Lewin is also in the back. Um, she is our Director of Science and Policy, so if you're interested in any of our river-related projects, water quality testing, definitely want to talk to her afterwards. And then we have Rick LaFaro, he is our Executive Director, and Kristen, there she is. Kristen Bailema, she is one of our watershed educators. So we want to thank you all for being here. Quick question for you all. For how many of you is this your first Roaring Corps Conservancy program? Wow. Wait, keep your hands up. Way up. That is all but two of you. <laughs> Darcy, that is awesome. Thanks, Darcy. Yay. <laughs> this is really exciting. So thanks, everyone, for being here. Did you all hear about this through Darcy? Yes. yes. Thank you. <laughs> so let me just give you a brief little introduction to who Roy Corps Conservancy is and um, what we do here. So welcome, first of all, to the, to the River Center. We are a 23, going on 24-year-old watershed organization for the Roaring Fork Valley. Uh, you get bonus points if you can tell me what a watershed is. Go ahead. A drainage. A drainage. Okay. Anybody else want to add anything to that? That is true, yes. It's a place where every drop of water would end up in the same place as you. Yeah. And so both of you said is the same is the same word if you will. We like to add the word um, land. It's an area of land that drains water to a particular river or stream. So everywhere around here, everything's draining to the Roaring Fork River, ultimately. And then ultimately into the Colorado River. Um, why does that matter, that piece of an area of land? Because whatever's on the land is going to have either a positive or a negative impact on the river, right? So, though we are a river organization, we pay a lot of attention to what's going on on the land. Okay? The good news is that if you take a look over here, we have a, a really nice watershed map here that was created uh, by Sarah Ewell, a local artist, if you're familiar with her. And that's available for purchase also if you're interested. And behind Megan, we have a topographic map of the Marine Park watershed. Some quick fun facts for you. The watershed is about 1,400 square miles. It's roughly the size of the state of Rhode Island. About 33% of it is in designated wilderness areas. The thing that I think is the coolest is that those areas are in the headwaters of our three major rivers. Who knows what our three major rivers are? Go. Rick, you're Crystal not allowed to answer. Crystal. Crystal no. Good. Crystal, Brian, Cameron, Court. Yeah, so the headwaters of those rivers are in beautiful forested areas, completely protected. What kind of water quality do you think we mostly have here in this valley? Good. Very good. Very good. There's a few places that need a little bit of help. I'm going to just leave you on that cliffhanger so that you go talk to Heather afterwards so that you hear about those places because we're actually helping improve some places that need some help, which is really exciting. So um, our mission has been for our 23 years to inspire people to explore, value, and protect the Roaring Fork watershed. Are you a, who, who here is a raptor? Kayaker? Angler? Just loves to sit by the river? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So here's what we know, and you know this too, intuitively. When you explore and have an ex expedition or an adventure somewhere, even if it's for an hour or two, you're going to find out things about this place that will make you value it, because it just becomes a special place that you've had a really cool experience. From that is going to grow this desire to want to protect this place. For you, for your grandchildren, for, like, for generations, because you want other people to have that experience. And so um, one of the ways we fulfill our mission is by our education programs. You can talk to Megan about those. We teach, I want to say last year we taught almost 7,000 students. Now some of those students were more than once, um, but that's not just school children. That includes individuals like yourselves because we offer a lot of adult and family programs in the summer, so I encourage you to go check out our website to learn more about that. 
Um, and then, of course, we have um, the work that Heather leads, which is our water quality monitoring. Uh, we have 22 sites in the watershed we monitor on a regular basis. We submit the data to the state. The state, in turn, submits it to the federal government as required through the Clean Water Act. So we're paying attention. We're paying attention to the Marine Brook watersheds. But we don't collect data just for data's sake, because we are scientists and we like data. <laughs> when we find that there is a place that needs extra attention, Heather can take that, Heather or Rick can take that information and can say, hey, you know what, we collected all this data from this particular river. The river's telling us this, okay? You might have a fever, might have an infection, okay? We can, the river, the data tells us that. And then we can go be a voice for the river, river when we go talk to an entity or an agency to say, we need to do something over here to protect it and here's what's going on. So we're involved in a lot of really neat things and a lot of neat programs, so I'm excited that Darcy has introduced you to us because I hope that we'll see you again in some of our future programs, okay? So that's just a little bit about us. Um, I'm gonna introduce Darcy here in the next minute, but I do wanna tell you a little bit about um, this presentation, the Brookshire Watershed Institute. Um, the Brookshires have been donors and friends of the Marine Corps Conservancy from the very beginning. And it was back, I want to say it was 1998, that they came to us and they said, wouldn't it be neat if you guys created this thing called the Watershed Institute? And you would bring water leaders from the region, from the state, nationwide, um, that would come here and talk about water issues or water adventures. Something to elevate the conversation about water beyond the Marine Corps watershed. Okay. We're a small watershed, but our little watershed contributes almost 10% of the flow to the Colorado River. That's pretty significant. When you consider that the Colorado River is feeding 40 million people, okay? So we have, we have a goal here, I think you all agree with us on this and will help us with this. We're here to protect the rivers, um, and one way to do that is to bring people like Darcy to talk about their experiences with rivers. So on that note, um, let me introduce you to Darcy. But you already know this about her. But let's brag anyway. Okay? All right, so Darcy is a graduate from Aspen High School. She learned to kayak on the Roaring Fork in Colorado Rivers at the age of 19 while she worked at, um, as a raft guide at Colorado River Raft. Anybody else work there? Heather? <laughs> <laughs> so here's the cool thing. Well, it's all cool. This is very cool. Darcy is the first and only woman to kayak the Amazon River from source to sea. Woo! <laughs> Uh, she has been whitewater kayaking for 21 years, and for the past 15 years, she has been considered one of the world's best female kayakers and one of the most accomplished expedition kayakers. She has won whitewater kayaking races throughout the world and has participated in and led kayaking expeditions in 18 different countries. I'm not done. I heard, like, I heard a <laughs> In addition, she has been a kayak, raft, and adventure travel guide for two decades and has owned and operated two kayak guiding businesses. Having taught and guided guiding, pardon me, having taught and guided kayaking in Ecuador, Colorado, Arizona, Alaska, Bhutan, Nepal, Kenya, and Idaho, she has built a reputation with paddlers throughout the world. So join me in welcoming Darcy. <laughs> Well, that is kind of embarrassing. I don't like when people say nice things about me. But, uh, I can start this talk with a little disclaimer that this is me in my comfort zone. And when I'm doing stuff like this, I feel very at ease and like in my habitat. But standing up here speaking from you all is very terrifying for me. So bear with me if I seem a little nervous and feel free to shout at me if I'm talking too quickly, which might happen. I'm here to talk about kayaking the Amazon River, uh, which I did in 2013 with Don Beveridge and David Midgley. And when people hear that and then look at me, there's often a bit of a disconnect in their brain. Um, I gave this talk in Edwards on Monday night, and before the show, a guy came up to me and said, are you the presenter because you don't look big enough to kayak the Amazon? <laughs> and I didn't really know what to say to him. Um, I should be used to this by now because this sort of thing happens to me all the time, but it still catches me off guard. But turns out you don't have to be that big to kayak the Amazon, and it turns out you don't have to be a lot of things that people might expect you to be in life. Um, I'm going to start with a little introduction of the river to begin with. So the Amazon River is more than 4,000 miles long, and that's longer, that's more than 1,000 miles longer than the distance from New York City to San Francisco. 
There's a lot of debate in the geographic world about whether the Amazon or the Nile is the longest river in the world, but all geographers agree that the Amazon is the world's biggest river by volume. So it holds 20% of the Earth's fresh water, and it's bigger than the next six biggest rivers on Earth combined. So stop and think about that for a minute. It's kind of hard to imagine a river so wide that you can't even see across it. Um, we don't have a very good frame of reference for that, but I'll tell you that it is a lot of water. This is the Amazon River, not the ocean. Um, for comparison, and I think most of us have an idea in our minds of what the Colorado River looks like in the Grand Canyon. And that's a big river for Western U.S. standards, but low water in the Grand Canyon is about 7,000 cubic feet per second, and low water on the Amazon is 7 million cubic feet per second. So we're talking about a lot of water. Um, I spent about five months on this river watching it grow from this wide to this thing here, and I still have a hard time picturing it or grasping it, how big this river is. So a lot of people want to know what was it like kayaking down a massive river, and um, I'll try to paint a picture for you. Um, who in the audience has had a really long, tiring day, a day that just left you totally drained? I'm sure we can all relate to this, right? Whether you got there from a fun activity, from work, or just from life in general. So conjure that feeling right now, and then throw in some oppressive heat and dehydration and about a billion bugs. And then imagine feeling that way for 148 days in a row. And add to that that one of your two kayaking partners, uh, one of the two people that you spend every waking moment with, tells you that he has no emotional intelligence and you can't get mad at him for being a jerk because he doesn't understand normal social cues. So that was Midge, David Kennedy, <laughs> and he is a brilliant computer programmer from London. And I was also with Don Beveridge, who's back here in the audience. He's my longtime boyfriend and partner in all things life, and he wasn't quite as annoying as Midge. <laughs> The other guy here that doesn't have a kayak is the landowner where we started our trip. But um, So a lot of people want to know, like, why would I want to do this to myself? Why would I want to kayak the Amazon? And I'm going to start the answer to that question with a quote from Oprah, because who doesn't love Oprah? Um, she was recently on The Daily Show with Trevor Noah, and Trevor asked her, what is the common characteristic of successful people? And Oprah answered, People get to where they want to go because they know where they want to go. Most people don't know where they want to go. A lot of people are going and being driven by what they think they should do, by what other people say they should do, by what they have carried in their minds for a long time that they should do. But the most important question you could ever ask yourself is, what do I really want? And I really like this simple definition of success, and of course, Putting it into practice is not so simple, but at least the idea behind it is simple. And I knew from my early 20s that what I wanted to do was kayak. And this probably isn't what Oprah meant. I figure out what you want to do, but kayaking is what I wanted to do. And um, I was able to build a pretty good life around it. I owned a whitewater kayaking business, and I had kayaked some of the world's hardest rivers. And so I was really lucky because I knew what I wanted to do. But on the other hand, I was also unlucky because a lot of people questioned my passion. Like, you need something else to do, they told me. This is an inappropriate thing to do, especially the older I got. Um, and I hadn't really lived a very traditional life up to this point. I'd always pushed back against the supposed to's in life. I am very small, and I'm a woman, and I'm really shy, but I tried not to let these things hold me back from what I really wanted to do. And when people told me that I couldn't do something, I would be bound and determined to prove them wrong. And when people told me that I should do something, I would really want to do the opposite of that, which I'm sure was really annoying for my parents growing up. But this was just my mentality. But it's hard to always go against the grain. And I was getting really tired of people asking me questions like, when was I going to settle down? When would I stop playing around all the time and get a real job? Didn't I want some security for the future, and when was I going to have kids? So I started thinking to myself, all right, <clears throat> I need to quit kayaking and uh, do some normal stuff. I should go find a job in an office and 
make more than $10,000 a year and get myself a 401k, and then maybe people will stop questioning my life choices. But kayaking and adventures had a really strong hold on me, and I wasn't really that interested in doing all these other things that everyone else thought that I should be doing. But I kind of got the idea in my mind that the Amazon could be like the mother of all adventures, and it would be like such a big adventuresome thing that I would satisfy all my cravings for this sort of thing, and I could move on and enjoy the rest of my life sitting in an office with my 401k. <laughs> so I guess the reason I wanted to go can be boiled down to sort of a simple search for contentment and validation of my life choices. <clears throat> so we'll see how that works out for me. But the idea behind the trip was born out of Midge's midlife crisis. So I mentioned that he was a computer programmer in London, but he, around age 30, started worrying that he would waste his entire life writing code and algorithms. And now, kind of, a, <clears throat> in hindsight, a funny contrast to the life questioning I was going through, but Midge decided he needed one big adventure in his life. And he scoured the adventure archives looking for the thing he could do. And he thought climbing Everest had been done too much, <clears throat> sailing around the world had been done too much, and he eventually discovered that nobody had actually kayaked the Amazon from source to sea. At that point, five people had traveled from source to sea on the Amazon, but they all either hiked around the whitewater or rafted sections of it. So no one had kayaked the whole thing. And then he learned that more people had walked on the moon than had descended the Amazon from source to sea. So that made up his mind. The only problem, Midge didn't know how to kayak. <laughs> he'd actually never even sat in a kayak when he came up with this idea, and he'd never been camping before in his life either. So Midge had a lot to learn, but that's where Don and I came in, because we run a company called Small World Adventures, guiding kayakers in Ecuador, and Midge read our website and saw that we offered instruction for total beginners all the way up to coaching for class 5 kayakers. So Min started coming to Ecuador so that we could train him to become a class 5 kayaker so that he could survive the whitewater and the headwaters of the Amazon. And for those of you that aren't familiar with river ratings, class 5 is the hardest runnable rating. So this is Midge surviving the whitewater in the Amazon. He's still in his kayak there, but it's not really supposed to be facing in that direction. <laughs> um, Don Beveridge has been kayaking most of his life, and he's very good at it. He's also a really patient and a good teacher. <clears throat> and so after about eight years of Midge coming to Ecuador, sometimes, sometimes for two weeks at a time, sometimes for up to two months at a time, Midge decided he was ready for the Amazon. He asked Don and I to go with him. So off we went, and um, finding the source of the Amazon is kind of a tricky thing to do. There's a lot of debate around the source, which I don't have time to get into all of it here. But I'll quickly tell you that between about 1960 and 2012, everybody agreed that the Amazon's longest tributary was the Aparimac River in Peru. In 2012, a guy named Rocky Contos discovered that the Montaro River was 47 miles longer. So we switched our plan, decided to start on the Montaro River, but still it's not that easy. That's kind of like saying, I'll just start on the Roaring Fork River. Well, if you want to start at the source of the Roaring Fork River, you have to go all the way up to the top of Independence Pass and find the highest elevation flowing water that you can find. The Amazon uh, drainage, or watershed, is about the size of the lower 48. And so it's a little tricky pinpointing the exact starting point. But we trekked around this mountain for the better part of the day, decided where we thought the highest flowing water was, and here's Don and Midge standing over the Amazon River. <laughs> so the source is at over 15,000 feet in elevation, and it is really cold. Mm -hmm. Those are frozen socks, frozen shoelace. When I think of the Amazon, I really think about heat and bugs and flat water. And we would get plenty of that eventually, but the first week, it was really cold. When we were able to finally start kayaking, we were in little irrigation ditches and some wetlands. Eventually, we got into the industrial areas. This is uh, down in mid paddling through a copper mine. 
The little feeder, the tributaries of the Montaro went through silver mines, copper mines, and then eventually ran into this lime mine where the entire river went underground for about two miles. So we had to carry our kayaks around until it popped back out from underneath the mine. There was also a lot of towns that supported this mining. And most of these buildings would have a PVC pipe that went straight from the toilet and ended in midair over the river. So this stuff would just end up in the river. And uh, there's a lot of pollution in the headwaters of the Amazon. And Don wanted me to mention that we should be thankful that Aspen has a plastic bag ban. So the trees don't look like that around here. Now eventually, we got to the Montaro River proper. And it started to feel more like a real river. Because of the dilution, it got less and less polluted, so we were thankful for that. And about a week into it, we got into the whitewater. The first 10 days of the trip, we had a support van that could come with us and meet up with us almost every night, so they could carry the bulk of our stuff. But after 10 days, the Montaro River dropped into a little crack in the earth, and we had to say goodbye to our support van. So this meant that we had to fit everything that we needed into those little kayaks. So camping gear, Food, stove, water filtration, rescue gear, spare paddles, satellite phone, passport money, anything that we needed we had to shove into those little boats, which does make kayaking class five a lot harder when your boat weighs 70 or 80 pounds. So we had a lot more challenges to deal with once we lost the van, but we also got some pretty awesome remote camping spots, so it was kind of worth it. All in all, the Montaro had about two weeks of class five whitewater. Uh, I do talk bad a little bit about Midge in the book, and he had a difficult personality, but I give him a lot of credit for transforming himself into from a non-kayaker, a nerdy computer guy who would self-admit had zero muscles to start with, into a guy that could paddle 14 days of non-stop class five whitewater. Including, we paddled through in total, we had 25 days of whitewater. Only about two weeks was class five, and the rest was everything from class one to class four. But we did the math, and in those 25 days, we lost, uh, we dropped 13,000 feet in elevation. So that meant that we lost 85% of our gradient in only 17% of our trip. The Amazon River, from where it's actually called the Amazon, has a gradient of 1.8 inches of elevation drop for every mile that you paddle down the river. For comparison, the slaughterhouse section here on the Roaring Fork River that's popular for rafting and kayaking drops 80 feet per mile. So we were in for a long flat paddle out. <laughs> Um, the next challenge we had was getting our sea kayaks delivered to a tiny little town called Puerto Ene in Peru, where the flat water begins. But after we succeeded in that, we dropped into what is known as Peru's red zone. And this area is kind of a notoriously dangerous part of Peru. Uh, before we went there, the two years leading up to our expedition, six tourists had passed through this area. And two of them were murdered, and one more was shot but survived. And right before we got there, we learned that um, the local people who live here are called the Shanika people. And they had just murdered eight Peruvian colonists who had come in to set up a logging operation. And the logging operation was illegal. It wasn't permitted. And we were really scared of the Shanika going in here. Um, I was so scared of them that I cut off all my hair, hoping that everybody would think that I was a boy and that we were a group of three guys and they might be less likely to mess with us. But uh, I don't, I want you all to leave this talk with a good feeling of the Ashanika, because even though they've done some bad things recently, they're doing this out of a place of fear. Um, everybody who's come into their territory basically in the last 200 years, has wanted to take something from them, starting from Franciscan missionaries, and then the rubber boom, and then more recently, like during the lifetime of the people that we met on the river, the Shining Path was active in Peru. Can you, how many of you have heard of the Shining Path and know something about it? For those of you that don't know about it, it's, um, it was a Maoist insurgency that started in Peru, and the idea behind it 
was a revolution of the poor to overthrow the rich. And that was the idea. But very quickly, it uh, devolved into a, a very violent terrorist, or, terrorist organization. And they ended up killing mainly the poor people in Peru. So their ideology and their actions definitely didn't match. And even though they were mainly active in the 1980s and 90s, they still exist today. But they've sort of taken over the security job for the drug traffickers who have moved in. And in 2013, Peru overtook Colombia as the world's number one cocaine producing region in the world. And there's also illegal loggers and government people that want to put dams on their river. So basically, anyone that comes to their land, to the Ashanika's land, wants to take something from them or do something bad to them. During the Shining Path, which they now call Peru's Civil War, the Ashanika lost a third of their population, 10,000 10, of them were murdered. So I don't blame them for not liking outsiders. And for us, through a combination of prearranged permission letters that we got from the Ashanika, basically just telling them what we were doing. So they wouldn't be worried when they saw three weird people kayaking through their land. We had the permission letters, we had a, a local escort and a motorized canoe. And then for the last two weeks, we had the Peruvian Navy escorting us. But we made it through, obviously. And we had nothing but great experiences with these people. Because they knew who we were and what we were doing, they welcomed us with open arms, brought us into their homes, gave us food, gave us everything we needed. So after the red zone, we still had three months to go. And, uh, we felt like we could take a little more time to enjoy things now that we weren't so worried about our survival. We saw pink river dolphins almost every day, and this is our photo we got of it. And here's a professional photographer's photo of it, so you can see what they really look like. Um, we saw tons of boat traffic. A lot of people, and I thought about this too, thought of the Amazon as kind of this giant wilderness. Which in a lot of ways it is because they know there's very little police, there's not really hospitals, if you need help you're not going to get it. But it's kind of not wilderness too in the sense that there's tons of boat traffic. This is like the I-70 of the Amazon and everything that moves up and down this river, up, up and down the corridor does it on the river. We saw logging barges, we saw super tankers, we passed villages almost every day including big cities, like this is Iquitos, Peru, which is the biggest city in the world that you can't drive to. We saw interesting trash. <laughs> and we entertained ourselves a lot with the high water line. So we were there during low water, and at high water, the river will be up to this level. Kind of a better example of it, this was a, a couple's house where we camped out one night. And they explained to us they built their house on stilts because every river or every year the river will get to this level. And you can see this water line up here where it often gets. But the crazy thing to me is if you look behind the house, the land is flat for a really, really long ways. So when the water is up to the second story on this house, it's also that high covering all that land that you can see. Um, during this time when like I said, we weren't concentrating on our survival so much because the white water was over, the red zone was over. And I let my mind drift and I would think about eating a salad or fresh vegetables. I think about skiing or biking or just using my legs somehow. Think about what would I do next in life. I tried to think of the job in the office with the 401k that I was going to have, but couldn't come up with any ideas that I really loved. But this kind of became dangerous to me because the more I thought about the outside world, the more anxious I got to get back to it. And I started getting really annoyed at Midge because he was coming really slowly and delaying my return to civilization. Now, a lot of people say that adventure is a mindset. It's a roll with the punches attitude that can expect the unexpected and that can deal with problems on the fly. You know, meaning like a little hiccup on a trip can either be a disaster or a fun adventure, and the only difference is your attitude. Well, on about day 120, I had a pretty bad attitude, and I was really pissed off about everything, and I let my emotions get the better of me, and I saw a plastic jug floating in the river, and that pissed me off too, because there's more trash in the river. But I took my kayak paddle, and I tried to hit it, and I missed, and I tipped over in my kayak, 
And as I'm swimming around there with all my stuff floating away, there was nothing left to do but laugh at myself and realize that this wasn't such a bad place to be stuck. After my little breakdown, we still had a little more than a month to go. <clears throat> and we started hitting the tides. Um, tides come up the Amazon River more than 600 miles. And when we first encountered them, we could still paddle against them. They weren't that strong. But eventually they got so strong that we could no longer paddle against them. So we'd have to sit on a beach and wait while the tide was coming in. We also got storms pretty much every day. And we learned to anticipate the storms coming so we'd hear the howler monkeys crying. We'd hear them off in the forest. And then five or ten minutes later, after the howler monkeys would stop crying, we'd get hit with a barrage of wind and rain and lightning. And it kind of added a longed-for adrenaline rush, but it was a little bit scary, too, because when we were in the middle of a big storm, it cut visibility to almost nothing. And we were sharing the river with some really big boats, so it was a little nerve-wracking. We also passed Manaus and the Meeting of the Waters. So this is the Rio Negro coming from this direction. This is the Amazon River coming from this direction. The Rio Negro is the world's seventh largest river. And because of differences in the temperatures of the two river and sediment load in the two river, they don't mix for more than 10 miles downstream. So there's just this line going down the river. Eventually, with maybe two weeks to go, we kind of left the high was dictated by high and low tide, not by rainy season and dry season anymore. <clears throat> so when the tide started coming in, we also kind of lost solid ground. Now it was mostly mangroves and mud flats, like no more rocks, no more sandy beaches. So when the tide would start coming in, we'd have to look for someone's dock and try to ask them in our pretty bad Portuguese if we could just sit on their dock for five hours. <laughs> Part of the reason communicating this was hard is because they would be like, why do you want to sit on my dock for five hours? And it was kind of hard to explain to them what we wanted to do. But eventually we'd make it, and they would let us. So it was kind of a typical village down in that zone with everything built on stilts and everything connected by boardwalks. Once the people realized that we just wanted to hang out for five hours, they were usually really nice to us and took us on a tour. These guys were a shrimping village, and this guy's building shrimp traps right there. And it's still fresh water at this point, so it was a freshwater shrimp. Um, and then we were getting really close to the ocean. We had a support boat for a while, and they got to the and said, we can't go with you any further because conditions are too rough. We thought we were about two days from our ending point, and we had been warned by previous Amazon expeditions that once we got to this place where there was an old lighthouse, that there would be nowhere to camp. So they told us to be prepared to paddle all night or do something really creative for sleeping. But we, of course, thought, like, no, we're smarter than all these other people, so let's just go out there and we'll find a place to camp when we get there. So we paddle out there, and we're looking for a place to camp, and all we can find is mangroves and mudflats, and I think, well, how bad can the mudflats be? Let's go out here. So I get out of my kayak and start walking across this mud flat, and I really immediately sink up to here. So then I'm like body crawling across the mud, and I made it from about here to the wall and back, and that took 15 minutes, and all I had accomplished was covering me head and toe in mud, which was now stinging, and all that I was surrounded by brackish salt water, so I couldn't wash off. So after that little expedition, we decided to find a little basalt rock that was sticking out, and we made our dehydrated meals. And we ate dinner, and as we were eating dinner, the rock went underwater because the tide was coming in. <clears throat> so then we got back into our kayaks and said, dang it, we are not smarter than all these other expeditioners. <laughs> so we sat in our kayaks. We found a little bay, sat in the kayaks from about 7 p.m. until 1 a.m. when the tide started going out again, and eventually our rock popped back out and we got on it and went to bed. Now this was the next morning when the tide was all the way out. So these are the mud flats that I tried to crawl around and this was our rock that we slept on. And of course in the morning we wake up and the tide's coming back in. And so we had realized weeks ago that it wasn't worth paddling against the tide. 
because there was also constant upriver wind at this point. And so if we stopped paddling, we'd go upriver at about five miles an hour. When we were paddling hard, we'd go downriver at about two miles an hour. So we just sat on this rock for about another five hours until the tide started going out again. We only had 10 miles to go, so we're pretty anxious to finish, but we just had to wait until the conditions were right. <clears throat> And then once we started paddling, even though it was only 10 miles, it still took us about six hours because the conditions were so rough. But eventually we got to a point where we couldn't see any more land. The water was blue now because we were actually in the Atlantic Ocean and we were no longer in the river. And we paddled past the little waypoint flag on the GPS that we had programmed in five months ago telling us that we had made it to the ocean. After we made it, we paddled about two miles into shore, and we were treated to a secluded white sand beach and a perfect sunset. In total, we paddled 4,300 miles, and it took us 148 days. We estimate that we took over 2 million paddle strokes. We were the first group to do the entire river to do source to sea in kayaks. Midge is the first British guy, British guy to kayak the Amazon. I'm the first woman and the first vegan to kayak the Amazon. And Don is the first guy to do it because his girlfriend made him. <laughs> so after five months of uh, thinking it through and failing to come up with any options that I liked besides my weird abnormal life, I decided that maybe being normal isn't all it's cracked up to be. <laughs> yeah.
we talked a lot more, but then after 150 days, we did kind of run out of things to talk about. <laughs> and, um, but waiting around with the tides was a, a challenging thing, because we really would have to sit on a beach or somewhere for five or six hours at a time. And when we had like little iPods with book on tapes, and we would talk a little bit, but by that point, we were kind of, number one, sick of each other, and number two, kind of out of things to talk about. <clears throat> so at that point, we probably went like, 75% silent contemplation or book on tapes and 25% like, oh hey, what do you what do you guys think about this? And then a five minute conversation would come up. But there was a lot of quiet time. <laughs> yes, Ricky. Did you see any animals besides dolphins? We did. We saw in the white water, we saw foxes and deer and otters. And in the flat water, we saw tons and tons of fish. We saw snakes. We saw caimans, which are like an alligator. What else? Birds. We saw tons of birds. Yes, tons Piranha. of birds. Piranha? We actually didn't see any piranhas. We kept, every time we get to a, a village and ask if we could camp on their beach, we'd say, oh, can we take a bath, or will we get eaten by piranhas? <laughs> and they would just laugh at us. I think you've been watching too many gringo movies, so you don't have to worry about piranhas here. But then they would warn us about uh, stingrays and caiman and giant catfish that apparently eat people. But we didn't see any of those either. <laughs> Judith. So throughout the book, you mentioned that you always had this need to prove yourself. And yes. knowing you from third grade, I can <laughs> attest to that. <laughs> um, I think that's a very human question, like, am I enough? Am I doing enough? I just want to know where you are now with that question, if you still have that mm -hmm. nag to prove yourself, or if you've arrived at a, few, like a place of peace. Well, so I thought that everyone would be really excited that I had kayaked the Amazon and would treat me differently, and that I would feel like I didn't need to prove anything, but <clears throat> when we came back from the Amazon, we landed at DIA, and we got on the shuttle bus to the rental car, and this couple from Louisiana started talking to us. And the lady was like, oh, you have so much luggage. And I was like, yes, yes, ma'am, we've been begging the Amazon. <laughs> or no, I said, we've just spent five months in South America. And she said, oh, that's nice, you're missionaries. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, like, I played that wrong. But no, ma'am, we're not missionaries. We have just kayaked the Amazon from source to sea. And then I threw it in. I'm the first woman to do that. <laughs> and she just looked at me. It was like this really awkward silence. And she was like, oh, that's nice. We're going skiing in Breckenridge. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, validation, please. Yeah, so that was kind of exactly what I needed to realize that no, nothing was really different, even though I had kayaking Amazon from source to sea. And to really answer your question, it's like I try to not worry about proving myself anymore. But still, every time we get to the footing of some hard river, some young boy will come up to me and say, like, are you sure you want to do this? And it used to be, like, just because I was so small, but now it's, like, old small lady. <laughs> <laughs> and it still bothers me as much as I try not to let it, but... More often than not, when that happens, then 20 minutes later, I'm throwing that guy a throw rope and pulling him out of the hole that he's been swimming in. And so, time and time again, I get personal retribution, but it doesn't necessarily quiet that idea or, or that thought of, like, I must prove myself. So you're still... Give me 10 more years, please. It's okay. It's okay. How long did you guys take to plan it? What was your approach to it? Mm. So most of the pre-planning fell on Midge's shoulders because he invited Don and I not even a year before the trip. And so, oh, you know, honestly, a lot of his focus was just on learning how to kayak. And then um, he did stuff like buy the sea kayaks and <clears throat> arrange to get them shipped. And one thing he did was he hired what he called a fixer, uh, a woman who lived in Lima, who had a lot of experience with that kind of thing. So she was in charge of like importing the sea kayaks, for example, because these sorts of things are really hard and time consuming and expensive, and he didn't want to have us waste time with that. So he hired someone to do that. But in terms of the other stuff, um, the whitewater of the Montaro River had just recently been run for the first time when this guy Rocky 
discovered it was longer. He went and ran it. And he didn't really give us any river notes or anything, but he said, yes, you can kayak the whole thing. So, you know, we knew that it had been done once and that, you know, we knew you'd have to scout and figure it out, but we also knew that it was possible, so that was good. And then in terms of food and stuff, we did a lot of kind of on-the-fly planning. When we would do self-support out of the kayaks, we'd package up boxes of food and find some Peruvian guy and say, like, hey, we'll pay you $200 to drive to this bridge 16 hours from your house and drop this food off to us in eight days. But a lot of that, like, in South America, it's really hard to plan very far in advance. It just doesn't work out that well. So a lot of that was just, like, paddle up to town. Um, you know, we'd have stuff shipped to a certain place beforehand, but then we'd just divide it up into boxes and find some guy that would be willing to take this one on this day, this one on this day. Did they all come through for you? <clears throat> they all came through for us, yeah. And then, like, the permission letters and stuff like that, that was all done in Lima. Like, we got there about a week before we actually went to the source of the Amazon, and in that week, we, we got the permission letters from the Ashanika, we got the people building the dam to agreed to stop dynamiting while we paddled through the construction site and a few other things like that. So for Don and I, it was mostly logistics as we went, and for Midge, it was more free planning. But it was hard. I mean, that was probably the most difficult part of the trip was the logistics, for sure. Also, how did you guys, how was your health? Did you all stay? Did you have any intense um, Midge got food sickness that lasted about 24 hours. <clears throat> I got a stomach bug at the Brazilian border that lasted about 24 hours, and John never got sick, and that was it, so, yeah. Yes? Um, how's Mitch now? Mitch is good. Um, throughout his training, he always joked that as soon as he finished the Amazon, he was going to quit kayaking. Oh, that was it. Oh, okay. we didn't believe him because he, we thought he enjoyed it a little bit. He spent so much time and dedicated so much to it. But he pretty much quit kayaking. He, uh, <laughs> he met a girlfriend through his kayaking club, and they ended up getting married, and now he has two kids. He's back to his computers, which makes him the happiest. So he's doing good. Do you know for a fact he's not writing a book about the trip? I don't. I would welcome him to write a book. Yeah. So it would be good to hear his perspective. <laughs> yes, Joe. So I just finished <laughs> Chapter 7, like right as I was going to try to nod off. To sleep and my adrenaline was just pumping with the stories of you know your kayak taking off on you and Don chasing it down and then blasting with the dam construction. Can you tell some of those stories or what was your most terrifying moment? We made it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably the most terrifying day was paddling through the dam construction site. And we did get them to stop dynamiting, which helped our cause, but it was still like a very unnatural riverbed because they were blowing up pieces of rock like the sizes of school buses that were falling into the river and the portage routes weren't much safer than the kayaking routes and so obviously we did make it but we had a few moments where we weren't sure that all of us were going to make it but I don't want to ruin the book. So. <laughs> Maggie. Um, so speaking about kind of health and in your body and how it all functions well on a trip like that. How do your legs deal with being in a kayak for that long every day, and how did you kind of counteract that? Uh, we didn't, we weren't smart people, and we didn't like do jumping jacks or something on the shore at night like we probably should have, but yeah, your legs get amazingly sore, which is weird to say because you're not using them at all, but just sitting in one position. And, you know, in the white water, it wasn't bad because we got out of the kayaks a lot to scout <clears throat> or to portage, and we were walking around a lot, a lot more. But in the flat water, we are just sitting in one position all day long. And um, I discovered that Peruvian women are really amazing volleyball players. So I got to play about five volleyball matches, which helped my legs a little bit. But of course, after not using legs for two months and then playing volleyball, they'd be super <laughs> sore the next day. And, but yeah, we didn't do much to counteract that. We just let them atrophy <laughs> be sore. <laughs> Don and I had like a week in Rio at the end of the trip because we couldn't get flights home in time. And we did some hiking around the granite domes and we definitely felt what we had done to ourselves then. But we came back here and had a winter of skiing and they recovered, so. Yeah. Oh, you're Why did you eat the hydrated food? 
Why did we eat dehydrated food? Because it's light, it comes in a bag about this big, so it's light, it's small, you can shove it in the back of your kayak, and then when you're ready to eat it, all you have to do is boil water and pour it in the bag, and then it makes food. So it was easy and it was light, that's why. Good question. I was curious about your parents' reaction to the letter. They didn't read the letter until they read the book. <laughs> and by that point, they knew that I had survived, so. <laughs> Yes, I wrote them a letter. As we were leaving Lima, I started to feel like maybe I was being a little irresponsible going in with so much unknown. Mainly, the white water, I mean, I was worried about it, but that was like a known thing. Like, I know how to deal with white water. The red zone and the people, um, that part was made me more nervous because people are more unpredictable. They have guns and stuff like that. So before we left Lima, I wrote my parents a letter saying like, hey, if you're reading this, it's because I did come back from the Amazon, but don't worry, enjoy your life, goodbye, blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> And I sent it to my friend Larry, and I said, hey, Larry, if we die, can you please send this to my parents? Luckily, it didn't come to that, but no, I was covering my bases, just in case. Did you write them to Lacey? It was to Ann, Bill, and Lacey. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't leave her out. <laughs> Decided before you made the trip that you would write a book about it, or when did that? Um, kind of. I I always liked writing, and I never I'd always written short articles and stuff. But I did think to myself, well, if we make it, this will be finally something worth writing a book about. So I did keep a journal the entire time, thinking that I would probably write a book. But I didn't actually decide that I was going to finish the book until. I wrote the last word, and the publisher said yes. So the whole time it was a struggle. It was like, oh, should I be doing this? This book sucks. It's too hard. It's too long. But I persevered. Here we are. Yes. Can you talk more about the final like moments when you were with Midge and your? I mean, how was that? Because I know there was strain. So was it like when we yeah, like finished? Yes. Yeah, so you yeah when you finished and then you said goodbye to him. Was that like a yeah we're done or like? You wanted to punch him in the face. <laughs> so, I mean, with the whole trip, we went back and forth between all liking each other, enjoying each, each other's company, and wanting to punch each other in the face. <laughs> the actual moment we finished, the ocean was really rough, and we kind of all went, yay, but we couldn't even high five because it was like too, the waves were too big and stuff. So, we turned and we went to, beach, to the beach, and that night on camp, yeah, we all had a nice time That's together. Good. That's good. Don brought, or Midge brought a bottle of champagne for him and Don. We all had dinner together. It was like a celebration. And then, um, yeah, after, when we were saying goodbye, I mean, like I would say that we're still friends. Maybe not after he reads the book. But <laughs> <laughs> I'd say we're still friends, but um, I don't know. It's hard. I think if you spend 148 days with anybody, you're going to have hard times, which we definitely did, but we also had really good times, too. Back there? Yeah, um, two things. Um, I love the way you constructed the book. Oh, thank the you. Glossary, the descriptions of uh, different categories, and the way you personified the different. Oh, I'm only on chapter three. <laughs> well, thank I can't you. put it down. Yeah. Um, so, just the way you felt. Uh, People who might not be experienced kayakers to understand what you were going through. I heartily recommend it. And the second thing is, I'm curious whether you can see a movie. Whether I can see a movie. <laughs> well, when we came back from the trip, a lot of people said, oh, it's too bad that nobody died or got seriously hurt because that would have made a much better movie. <laughs> So, yeah, I think it would be pretty cool if they decided to make a movie about it. But I do worry a little bit, like, we were successful and maybe we didn't have enough drama to make a, a movie. But the, the agent is pitching it, so we'll see what happens. Right. Yeah. It would be cool. Yes. How's your 401k? <laughs> it's not very good right now. <laughs> I'm still working on it. Yeah, come on the movie. Yeah. He paid for the 
whole trip, but he did not pay us. So we didn't have to spend any money, but we didn't make any money either. We just grew in life experiences. <laughs> yes, you have a question? <laughs> you can think about it. Did you have a decent map of the river before you started to show the white water and waterfalls and such? Well, so surprises. we had a really, really good maps of the Aparimac River because that was the one that we all thought we were doing. So Midge had incredible maps of that entire river system. And then about a year before we went, when we switched plans to the Montaro River, <clears throat> there were not good maps of the Montaro River. So we had a couple topographic maps, but they only showed certain sections of them, and it wasn't a complete map of the river. And so we did talk to uh, Rocky Contos, who did the first ascent of the Montreal the year before us. And he, you know, he said, there's some really serious whitewater, there's some stuff you're going to have to portage, but you can figure it all out. So we kind of knew going into it that there wouldn't maybe be anything, any, no weird surprises that we wouldn't find on any other rivers that we had run. But... Yeah, we really didn't know what we were getting into on a day-by-day -day basis. So we knew the construction site was coming. We knew a few access points from our maps, but that was about it. It was a real adventure and exploration when we were in the river. Yes? Why did you decide to write the book? Why did I decide to write the book? Because um, I've been pretty lucky my whole life and had really good support. And even with that support and with that luck, a lot of people told me, like, you can't do this. Or so you can't play volleyball because you're too short. Or so you can't kayak because you're a girl or you're too little. And I luckily didn't listen to these people, and I just did what I wanted to do. But I wanted to write the book to make sure that other people don't listen when people tell them they can't do stuff. Except listen to your mom. <laughs> <laughs> Dams are built. Uh, is that for I don't know. Underwater? There's three dams that exist on the Montaro already, and the the construction site was for a fourth dam that they're building. And it's not going to be like a huge reservoir dam. It's a diversion dam to generate power. Um, I don't think that I would go back because I feel like we got pretty lucky making it through that <coughs> section of the river, and just like with the banks being so destabilized and stuff. I mean. The dam might make things a little bit more stable, but I think leading up to the dam, all that dynamite, they, dynamite work they did makes it dangerous enough that I wouldn't want to risk it again. And I think if you could access the sections above and below the dam, you could still have good whitewater kayaking, though. Yeah, because it won't flood a bunch of stuff. Yeah. So, Darcy, 23, 12, 13. That was our end date, December 23rd. Okay. Yeah. We originally thought we might end like around December 15th, but um, we didn't anticipate the tides and the wind and the rough conditions at the end, so we ended up having to push our tickets back a couple times. But yeah, December 23rd is when we finished. When did Don take something to add to? <laughs> 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 well, I guess the, the kayaking part of the dam flooded, ruined it. The dams they have there are. Uh, Pretty short ones. We paddled through three reservoirs. It took us an hour, maybe two hours across a reservoir. We did have permission, but we had to break into a dam and crawl down the spillway, go through a barbed wire fence, and then we put back in and had more rapids. So I think the river corridor is still going to be interesting. Yeah. It's not going to be a Lake Powell type ruin, yeah. a thousand, five hundred miles, but it's going to be uh, one more dam to trespass over. <laughs> Yeah. Was there, uh, you timed it so that you would be there at low water, would it have been pretty much undoable at high water? I think so. We, um, the, the two weeks of class five white water, that part would have been unrunnable with much more water. You know, it was, it was good while we were there, it was appropriate water level, but I think with maybe a meter more water, it would be unrunnable. And it was, it was really continuous, so there weren't, it wasn't like a rapid and a big pool. It was like rapid after rapid after rapid. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so we started at the end of July, which is pretty much lowest water you can get, kind of the end of the dry season there. And I think 
That was a good choice for surviving the light water. <laughs> yeah. Reggie, you have good questions. That's a good question. I don't know the answer to that one. But I guess uh, she, uh, he asked, "What time? Why did I go to the Amazon River if it's such a dangerous place?" And that is a good question. But I think facing danger and overcoming challenges is an important part of all kinds of life. Whether you're doing it on the Amazon River or at school with your friends or your teacher, or anytime something seems a little scary, it's good to. See if you can rise up and face the challenge. Christina? I have a question from Facebook. Nancy Campbell's asking what some of the most beautiful sites were on your trip. Tell Nancy that if she didn't come here, I'm not answering her question. <laughs> <laughs> Stunning I've ever seen. The Andes are a really amazing mountain range, and this river cuts through some of the hardest bedrock of the Andes. So it was an amazing canyon while we were uh, in our whitewater boats. Down in the flat water, it was green trees as far as you could see. We had really cool storms that I really enjoyed, and the birds flying around, the fish jumping, the dolphins jumping. It was all pretty nice. Now, does anyone that actually came to the event have any questions? <laughs> <laughs> they were told you were very happy to do that and very compliant. Uh, <laughs> so I shouldn't be bullying this person. <laughs> I'm sorry, Nancy. <laughs> um, so, since you all taught and, and trained Midge, is that his name? Did you feel confident that he had the abilities necessary? We did, yeah. I mean, he really truly did become a class five kayaker. Kind of the things that he was still lacking when we went was sort of the, the expedition sense. So <clears throat> I wouldn't have felt good about his chances if we sent him off alone, because he still wasn't as proficient at scouting or figuring out lines for himself. But if Don or I scouted and told him where to go, he was pretty good at doing that. Do that. Can you talk about rescue? You mentioned you had like a, a spot device, like say worst case scenario, how would have someone reached you? So we had a satellite phone. <clears throat> we all had spot devices, which are satellite communication devices where you can push an SOS button. And like if you did that here in this valley, um, search and rescue would come get you. And then if they decided it was necessary, they would send a helicopter, flight for life to come get you. I don't know if anyone actually will come in the Amazon. <laughs> so it was kind of nice in theory. We also bought global rescue insurance, which theoretically means that you know if you press that SOS button and you have global rescue insurance, that the military of whatever country you're in will come and help you. Again, I don't know if it would have happened in Peru. Like, we did go past one uh, military base on the river. So maybe they would have come and found us and done something, but you know, regardless of if you know, even if someone came, it would have been days, I think, before they would have got to us. So we had these things with us, but I think all it really would have done was notify. Like we had um, Shannon and Don's brother and Larry were like our SOS people here in the U.S., and so they would also get the message if we sent that out. And I think them knowing that something bad has ha had happened to us would have been the most value we got out of pushing the button. So, yeah, we were really trying to do everything in our power to not get in that situation. Okay, one more question. Okay. Did yeah. you have prearranged uh, places to pick up supplies, or did you do that all on the fly on the way? We did that on the fly. So, <clears throat> as we dropped into the Whitewater Canyon, we went to a town and we prearranged all the next food drops from that point on. When we left Lima, we had like a duffel bag full of gear for the flat water that was different than the gear we used for the white water. We had that shipped to where the flat water began. So we did some prearranging of that stuff, but most of it was done on the fly. You know, we'd get to a village and we'd say, okay, here's stuff for two weeks worth, and we'd get it into the right hands to hopefully get it delivered to us. 
And it always worked out. So we were really lucky about that. All right, Darcy, thank you so much. Thank you. 